thank you all so much for being here. I want us to imagine that we have a time machine and we can go back to the year 1900. We're standing on a busy street corner in New York City. I'm sorry, I'm really emotional about this. All right, I'm better now. So let's imagine that we have a time machine and we can go back in time to the year 1900. We're standing on a busy street corner in New York City, but we're also standing on the threshold of the 20th century. Airplanes haven't been invented yet. They'll be invented in 1903 when the Wright brothers do their first flight at Kitty Hawk. The Model T Ford, the first practical automobile, hasn't been invented yet either. So it won't be invented until 1909 by Henry Ford, and he'll eventually sell 16 million of them. The thing is that everyone around us right now is using horses for transportation, pretty much. It's a very, very primitive time in the United States, around the world. Now imagine on that same street corner, a huckster is there, and he gets up on a soapbox. He raises his voice so that a crowd gathers around him. And he says to the crowd, I want to show you the new fuel of the 20th century. It's called gasoline, and it's going to change the world. Gasoline is cheap, and there's a nearly infinite supply of it. We're going to pump it out of the ground just like you get water out of the well. And he's right. At that moment in history, the entire world is going to switch over to using oil pumped out of the ground, turned into gasoline or diesel fuel or jet fuel, turned into fossil fuels that can power every part of our transportation infrastructure. Cars, buses, trains, airplanes, ships, everything is going to use these liquid fossil fuels. And it really is going to change the world. It's, it's an amazing transformation because the entire world economy is going to come to depend on fossil fuels. Gasoline, it's super cheap, relatively speaking. It's super easy to transport. It contains a ton of energy. It's perfect. It really does look perfect, except for one minor thing. So at that moment in history, nobody, or at least not enough people, ask the question, now wait a minute, fossil fuels, are there any possible downsides here? Anything that could possibly go wrong with this idea? And here we are, 123 years later, and we're looking at an unfolding disaster caused by these fossil fuels. We burn fossil fuels, puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and we're seeing a huge range of terrible side effects from that carbon dioxide. So the biggest thing is that the temperature of the planet is rising. The planet is heating up. This causes immense droughts in many different parts of the world. Conversely, in the wet areas, it can also cause massive flooding, like we saw in Pakistan last year, where like a third of the country, Pakistan, is underwater from the flooding that occurred. Hurricanes, monsoons, cyclones, they're all getting stronger because the ocean is warmer. They gather more energy, so they cause more destruction. Droughts and floods and hurricanes are all causing crop failures, which is gonna to lead to global food shortages. And we're already beginning to see the start of that now. The other like unexpected thing, no one really predicted this, is that major rivers like the Mississippi River or the Danube, rivers that have been flowing forever, are drying up in the summertime. And that has big problems for transportation, for drinking water, for cooling factories and power plants. Antarctica is melting, so is Greenland. That causes sea level rise. 
We have permafrost melting in the Arctic, releasing carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere besides the carbon dioxide and methane that human beings are emitting. The oceans are heating up, the oceans are acidifying, and this is affecting most marine species now. And we can safely say that we're at the beginning of the sixth mass extinction event. So the fifth mass extinction event was the asteroid that came 65 million years ago and killed all the dinosaurs. We're going to create, we, humanity, are going to create the sixth mass extinction event through the global heating and other problems that that's causing. Just one example of a side effect that's gonna affect all of us. This is a picture of Miami. On the left, Miami area, the Miami greater metropolitan area as it stands today. And then on the right, this is NLAA or the National Oceanic and Administrative or Atmospheric Administration's prediction for what will happen to the Miami area with 10 feet of sea level rise. Essentially, Miami won't exist anymore. There's six million people there now. They're gonna lose all that they have, the houses, the apartments, the businesses, the roads, and the infrastructure, it'll all be underwater. Those six million people will be streaming out into the rest of America, which already has a housing shortage, and this is gonna be happening Miami, Boston, Washington DC, New York City, London, Shanghai, any coastal city is gonna experience this and up to a billion people could be displaced through this one process alone. So, we started burning fossil fuels around 1900 in a serious way. We switched over to liquid fossil fuels. Now we see the terrible side effects. If we were smart and rational and could act together as eight billion people in a species in a rational way, what would we be doing right now? We obviously would be taking immediate dramatic steps given what we know is coming given the amount of catastrophe that is going to be arriving. Just the thought of losing all the coastal cities should be enough to inspire us. We could have started acting in the 1960s, that didn't happen. We could have started in the 1980s, that didn't really happen. We could have started in the 2000s, that didn't really happen. We aren't really doing anything dramatic, impactful, uh, you know, intense right now to solve climate change. But what would we do if we could act as a species? We would absolutely, we would ban fossil fuels. We would just put a big stake in the ground and say, we, the entire human community on planet Earth, we're going to stop using fossil fuels. That's been impossible so far. And we can look at this graph and see what's been happening. So this shows gigatons of carbon dioxide emitted by us burning fossil fuels over time. It starts at 1850. We were hardly burning anything, just a little bit of coal. Grew to 1900, grew to 1950, exploded between 1950 and today. So today, humanity is emitting about 35 gigatons of carbon dioxide by burning fossil fuels on planet Earth. What is going to happen in the future? If we were uh, going to look at the possible futures that are available to us, this is one possibility. We just keep on keeping on. We burn more and more and more fossil fuels. We dig every bit out of the ground, we light it on fire, and we send the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Scientists know, this isn't like speculate, No, this would be an utter catastrophe, probably uh, is the complete destruction of civilization and most natural species on planet Earth. Somehow we have to prevent that. But even this scenario, say we could level off here at 35 gigatons a year and hold steady, even that is catastrophic. 
This is what needs to happen. But we show, we, humanity, shows no sign of being able to accomplish this. It's like we're addicted to fossil fuels, that you know, we're unable to take the giant world economy and its dependence and shift it into anything like that right now. We don't have the political will, the global will. It simply isn't, there's no evidence that it's happening. So we would ban fossil fuels if we were smart and rational and could act as a species. We would also start extracting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, meaning the history of our burning of fossil fuels has dumped almost two trillion tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We would start pulling it back out. We have machines that can do this. We have prototype systems that can do this then we would absolutely do everything possible to save the rainforest. And the reason for that is because right now we're in the process of cutting down and burning down and destroying the rainforest. And if they collapse, then that'll release hundreds of gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as they convert from forest to either grassland or desert. So this gets us to this weird spot where there's this paradox with climate change. We know, scientists know, thoughtful people know that humanity has to get on a different path. We have to do something. But the problem is that we, us in this room, we can't do anything to affect those changes. So, we cannot cause the world to ban fossil fuels. We can advocate for that. We could have people sign petitions perhaps, but nothing so far has moved the needle. So we can't do that. We can't do anything to cause a gigantic effort to extract carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We can't stop what's happening to the rainforest in and the Amazon or in Africa, there's just not any change that we as individuals or we as this group can affect at a global scale. So what could we do? Like what is there that we could contemplate doing that we could make happen reasonably in our sphere of influence to somehow help with this climate change problem? And this is the proposal. What if we could turn NC State, our university, into a shining star of an example of what the world needs to do to counter climate change? And by that I mean, what if we were to make NC State perfectly green? The people in this room, the people on campus, could affect this change. NC State could become perfectly green with enough uh, effort, with enough foresight, with enough pressure, this university could become a perfectly green university. So what might that mean? First, we would convert NC State over so that it's 100% solar powered. We would put solar panels on every building, on every parking deck. We'd build solar farms on vacant land that's available all across campus, we could easily power NC State with the sun, and it would probably be cheaper, given how far down the price of solar panels has come. We could convert over from smelly diesel buses to electric buses. It would it'd put a stake in the ground. It would say, here's an electric future that we have made possible at NC State. And we could also make those buses run a lot more smoothly so that people are incented to use them. There's a system called bus priority systems that causes traffic lights to change and let buses flow very freely used in bus rapid transit systems. We could make those buses essentially uh, twice as fast as they are on campus now. We could build the system to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So when people commute onto campus, 
that carbon dioxide that they admitted could be extracted back out of the atmosphere. And similarly, we could create synthetic fuels on campus. We're one of the finest engineering schools in the United States and the world. We certainly have the ability to pull this off. And in this way, even though when I commute to school, I'm emitting carbon dioxide with my car, the university would just extract it back out of the atmosphere and we'd be at net zero. And we could do a dozen more things like this very easily at this university to make us perfectly green. To do this, we need to get everyone involved. Obviously, we need student government involved. We need the student body involved. We need the faculty and staff. There's 7,000 staff people at this university alone. Uh, it's a huge group of people, the administration, and then alumni. There's 280,000 alumni from NC State scattered all over the world. All of us together could get this going, and then it would be a source of pride for us. I think everyone who's conscious of climate change today feels some amount of guilt or distress or anxiety or nervousness about the idea that the planet is being destroyed, if we could all get on board, I think we would all feel better knowing that at least in this one place, we have solved the climate change problem. The important thing then is to shout about what we're doing at NC State. It's 100% a marketing problem where we're doing all this stuff and we're broadcasting out all the things that we're doing and our desire to make a perfectly green campus. So we would change the logo, maybe for a period of time, it's green, not red. We would put messages on football and basketball jer jerseys about what we're doing here at NC State. We would use press releases, speeches, conferences. We'd make as much noise as we can about everything that's happening here and the effort we're taking to make this university perfectly green. This means that we would solve that paradox locally because we have the power, perhaps, to make that local change happen. And once that change starts here, we could help other universities affect the same change. We could help Raleigh become a perfectly green city. We could help the Research Triangle region become perfectly green as well. So we act as a seed and we spread things out from the core here at NC State. We make NC State this shining star for all the world to see and we make sure that everybody knows about it. And in the process, not only do we have change happening on campus, but we also have the pride of making that change happen, and we can see the effect spread from its starting point here at NC State. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today.